Good afternoon. President Walls, Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, fellow honorees, moms, dads, families, and the main event graduates. I had to do that as part of the obligatory opening statement. Uh, I'm supposed to laugh at a few of these lines, but because uh, I've been told I gotta keep this short. And uh, you probably thought as the Chief Justice you might hear from me on uh, some legal law points. I got news for you. I'm not going to talk about the law. But I do want to introduce you to a, a new legal term that's hot, that's scintillating, that's the ripping across Twitter right now. It's called holy schmoly. <laughs> there are a lot of people here. Uh, I don't usually talk to crowds of this size. In fact, I'm lucky if I see 30 people in the courtroom. So I feel a little bit out of my comfort zone. But I share this stage uh, as a proud parent, and I want to say congratulations to all the other parents. And I have to make a confession that I accepted this invitation with great trepidation, hesitation. So I need all of your help. I need the fire hose, I need the speed. Are you out there? <laughs> all, all the parents, all the faculty, please faculty, put your red pens away. Uh, you know, it's a daunting task to give a commencement address, and I'm going to try and keep it short. But uh, let me ask you this. Who remembers, you don't have to answer this, but think back. Do you remember who gave your commencement address? Or, better yet, what they had to say? I guess I've got that going for me. But I can't embarrass my daughter, Claire. I can't embarrass uh, my wife, Mary. Although i got to tell you, she said, she sent me an email from one of her faculty friends, Jeanette, or on the staff, I'm not sure, who said, uh, well, did you hear that story about when Barack Obama decided to run for president, and his wife, Michelle, said, just don't mess up. So, from my wife, she said, don't mess up today. And by the way, those of you who are mathematics students, I feel your pain. <laughs> I would have easily gotten an F the moment I walked in the front door of her classroom. And to uh, President Balls, I want to tell you, when you asked me to give this, I first asked Claire, is it okay? I first asked my wife, but he's a smart guy. He had already gone to them and got there okay. <laughs> and my entire central nervous system, every bone in my body, my mind, my body, my soul was screaming that Nike commercial, just say no. <laughs> and what did I do? I said yes. So I'm standing here, you're stuck with me, Claire's dad. And I'm not a comedian, I'm not a scholar, but I'm here. And they say 50% of success is showing up, so I need you to help me with the other 50%. And the reason this is so daunting is there's really four audiences. The first audience, of course, are the students, the main event. There's the parents, and the family, there's the faculty, and there's that fourth group, the smartphones. <laughs> I don't know if you're looking at your smartphone. I don't think they're streaming this live. And then I, I did a lot of research. Don't count this then against my time. This is all part of the intro. Uh, you know, I did a lot of research. There's a lot of great speeches out there on the internet. If you don't like this one today, go on the, the Google, you'll find it. Oprah's giving a talk at Harvard. Robert Redford at Westminster. And think about this. My brother Joe, I only have one brother. He has one son. He's graduating from Marquette University today. Guess who their convincing speaker is? Bill Cosby. <laughs> Bill Cosby, Tom. Bill Cosby, Tom. <laughs> and on top of that, I've got Moselle Singh, who's going to give the uh, address on behalf of the, uh, the students following me. I think I'm more uh, at fear than she is. But I want you to know I've jettisoned all my notes that I had prepared. I had set aside two days to, to work on this. And Mark Twain says, you know, give me more time and I'll, I'll write you a shorter letter. And uh, I blocked out a chunk of time to put this together. And I worked on it all day Friday. I threw it all away yesterday because I read a magazine article Saturday morning. I'm going to kind of key off of here. But I'm not going to offer any sugar-coated platitudes. And I know that on many minds of the students, a job is, is probably in the forefront. That's probably the forefront of the parents who are saying, you know, it's time for the bank of mom and dad to close. Uh, but keep this in mind. The unemployment rate is 
sadly to say 7.5%, but it's the best it's been in five years. Now what's better news is that the unemployment rate for college graduates is 3.8%. You still think that's not the best. I mean, I know the difference, and I'm not an economist, between a recession and a depression. A recession is when your neighbor's out of work. A depression is when you're out of work. But moms and dads, you need to know this. The economists tell me, tell us, that it's still a 15.2% on your return for investing in college education. So all I can say is be persistent and don't give up. But I want to offer this, that the, uh, this generation is really remarkable for a couple of reasons. Uh, you've come of age in both a fast-paced and turbulent times, both good and both bad. Uh, the bad is that you've come of age in the shadow of 9-11, the Columbine, high school shootings, Newtown, Sandy Hook. The good is that you were 10 years old, more or less, when a guy named Steve Jobs launched the iTunes store. That's right, your moms and dads and I, we all got to go to Steve Jobs, and we want to make sure there's a way our kids are able to buy any song they want just with the touch of a finger on their phone. You probably thought it had been there for decades and decades, but it's only 10 years old as of April 28th. You were born, more or less, between 1990 and 1992 when the internet was first invented. And more importantly, that was the time the first SMS, text message, was set. And I would venture to say that among all of you here, you probably sent over 4 million text messages in your four years of college. And in fact, most of us as moms and dads are happy we discovered that phone companies have unlimited texting plans. And when you were born, the Cubs were 182 years removed from a World Series. <laughs> now think about that. Today, the Cubs are still removed from a World Series. But the nice thing is with your smartphone, iPhone, I, whatever, it's 4G, you can watch the Cubs play. You can play games on there, surf the web, and of course send text messages. And our parents, your parents, are part of the big baby boomer generation. Uh, you are the computer tech. There's some official title out there, I don't know, Generation X, Y, or Z. I'm not sure what it was. But I want you to know that uh, when I graduated, when you were only a twinkle in the eyes of your parents over 35 years ago, I had failed. When I was a young man, I didn't want to be on the court. Before the Chicago Bulls were in existence, I wanted to be a guard for the Boston Celtics. That didn't happen. You didn't find that funny either, okay? <laughs> but I want to say this on a serious note, that the dots in our lives don't connect looking forward. They connect when you look back on what you start out to do. In fact, there are many 21-year-olds who are interested people, not necessarily, well, yes, today, of course, but, but in the future, who at 21 didn't know what they were going to do. And there are some 40-year-olds who still don't know what they want to do, but they're interesting people nonetheless. Now, President Balls wrote an open letter to his daughter, Angie, four years ago when she began here as a student. And there's one line in there that I really love. And he said, a real education is not a street map to a job. But he also said, I hope you learn the difference between an opinion and an informed opinion. And my characterization of that is having an informed opinion means you're a thoughtful thinker. And what we need from all of you is thoughtful thinking, thoughtful thinking professionals in the marketplace, in whatever profession you choose to pursue, because today's economy is very extremely competitive. And unfortunately, there are a lot of smart people with Ivy League degrees who caused problems in our economy because they thought of bad things about cooking the books and so forth. So my, one of my pieces of advice is when in doubt, do right. You will gratify some and probably stun others. And to lower the bar, and you may think I'm crazy when I say this, but just don't make things worse. Really. Commencement speakers usually talk about waxing poetic and lofty ideals about go follow your passion, change the world. And I watched Saturday Night Live last night with the return of Amy Poehler with uh, Seth Myers. I hope that's the right name. 
You know that line where they say, okay, really? Life is a doggy dog world. Economic survival is a threshold challenge, a basic necessity. But I want to share with you something that Don Wooten, who's on the stage, is going to get one of the honorary degrees today. Uh, Thursday night, and by the way, Ben, I'm kind of moving towards the closing here. Uh, he mentioned many things. He's a man of classics, of literature, arts, started a public radio station, and so forth. But he was a state senator in Illinois, one of the crazy eight back in, well, I'm not sure the exact dates, so I don't want to say. But uh, he mentioned how politics, and I want to bring this home in a very practical, concrete way, is really polluting our political institutions. Campaign politics today is a nuclear war, really, in my view, bent on mutual destruction, causing great collateral damage to all of us in this room. Citizens are understandably dissuaded from participation. And what's the most sad thing is that the consultants say, you gotta run these negative ads. You have to do it. It's the only way you're gonna win, so they run the negative ads. Now what happens? People get muddied up, they don't think things through, they don't have a thoughtful opinion on what really is going on, and they choose not to participate. And the best story is that, at least on that, it comes home to me. When I ran in 2010, I was subject to negative ads, and there was a woman who wrote a letter to the editor uh, in the local paper here who said, you know, I'm just fed up with it, all these negative ads, not just mine, but the U.S. Senate, uh, other races around the country. And she said, uh, but that guy Kilbride, I like his ads, I like his message. And then she goes on and says, but I'm not going to vote on election day. Great, we spent all this money to get the message out, and this lady who compliments us doesn't want to vote. Well, you didn't think that was funny either, okay. Uh, but here's what I want to close out with. Uh, when Don Wooten was a state senator, there was fierce battles. It was a battle of policy, it was a battle of ideas. And the class of honorees that are here know this, they're really... I don't want to date you, but uh, Tom Brokaw talks about the greatest generation ever that understands that voting is a precious right. Do you know how much money was spent last year in the presidential election? Two billion dollars. That's with a B, not a billion. Two billion dollars. A lot of food, a lot of health care, a lot of education could have been spent with two billion dollars. Now, what was the result? Less than one half of those eligible to vote voted. Now what's lost in our collective memories of this country is the fight for women's suffrage, the right for women to vote, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And equal citizenship means equal responsibilities. And we glorify constitutional rights, but we decline to participate. 35 years ago when I graduated, we thought we were really cute. And I think it was a meaningful gesture. I don't even remember the number of students that did this, but we had some buttons made up. Uh, we stuck them in our pocket, really this was 35 years ago. We were seated, and during the commencement address, we reached into our pockets, pulled out the button, put it on our robe, and it said, who decides? Who decides? We thought that would be safe. It's a rhetorical statement. Who can sanction us for that? Well, the answer is, those who participate are those who decide. If you don't decide, if you don't participate, you don't get to decide. And for those of you who weren't there, for those of you who were there this morning, and I wish I could remember the name of the teacher, uh, but Bishop Burke talked about second grade. And every day, the second grade teacher would call the roll call of every student in his classroom. And every student had to raise his or her hand and say, present. And that's what we're asking you to do, to show up, to stand up, to be counted, and hopefully, maybe one day, the first woman governor in the state of Illinois will be a graduate of Augustana College. Or maybe we get the president of the United States. So let me close with this. Let me close with this. Uh, you know, there's the two thoughts. And this really is it, Ben, I'm telling you. Uh, the most eloquent constitution anywhere in the world is worthless and we have somebody to enforce it. And I want to give you this statement as your challenge. And this is a quote. It's very short. It's from a, a, a judge by the name of Justice Learned Hand, 
And he said, I often wonder whether we do not rest our hopes too much upon constitutions, upon laws, and upon courts. These are false hopes. Our liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When liberty dies in our hearts, no constitution, no law, no court can save. Thank you.